the Lannisters are really the Ferengi of the Game of Thrones universe, I suppose. What do you think no about it? No wonder I so. love Tywin so much. <laughs> Welcome back to Nerd Legion. It's me, Monty, and your friend, Doa. We're here to talk about the finish of House of the Dragon. Very controversial because people are bad and hate pacing and character development, apparently. They would rather <laughs> just have a dragon blowing fire everywhere for no reason, as opposed to naturally build into that with real relationships. We'll get it to that. It is pretty though. cool, though. <laughs> we'll have plenty of that. We also had plenty of it. We will have plenty more of it. Yeah, we got yeah. a good amount. Uh, I think those complaints are really ridiculous. The show is still better than Game of Thrones. Um, uh, yes and no. It's it a is. little bit different. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit. It's a little bit less. Uh, you know, epic fantasy than Game of Thrones was. Game of Thrones is very heavy political fantasy, right? Obviously, but there was a an epic scope to it. It was happening in you know, vastly different locations at the same time. Whereas this is is largely centered around a smaller part of the world, you know, mostly King's Landing and Dragonstone, uh, with a couple little exceptions here and there. Even Harrenhal isn't that far away, right? So it's smaller in geographical scope for the most part. Unless for you're now. Off, unless you're off mud wrestling with people in the Seven Cities. <laughs> But uh, uh, you know, but but it's it's much more tight on the political drama, so it's it's a little bit different. But it's it's expanding in scope. It's doing what the Expanse did yeah. very well, which is go from small scope to enormous scope in a very natural way, uh, which also yeah. made the Expanse very good. So this show is actually just controlling its pacing super well. Uh, the plebs, though, having having trouble with that. The these intellectual small <laughs> folk as we call them in <laughs> Westeros. Hey, you never know when one of those small folk can ride a dragon, right? <laughs> most of them will be burnt alive, but every once in a while, they get a couple that can do it. I, I wish most of the commenters would be burnt alive, though. That's what I, I think. Uh, wow. Yep. It's wow. okay. Those are the people giving us views, man. You got to be careful with that. <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't have pleb fans, though. That's that's not true. Oh, plebs, oh, you're right. You're right. The plebs watch us on TikTok and get very angry, especially about the boys, by the way. Man, the, the number of, like, boys apologists is fucking crazy. I don't know how you can actually defend <laughs> that, show. That, that last season was terrible. It was objectively, like, I, one of I the think, worst seasons of television I've seen I think there are 16-year-olds who... Boba Fett. <laughs> there there are I think there are 16 year olds who think that edgy content has never been made before. And so that this is just the king of content. That's my I guess. guess if you'd never seen like that kind of thing before, then you may be like, oh, my. But like we grew up with like, you know, well, it started. I mean, you know, as far as edgy for the time, it started out with like, you know, the Simpsons even and like Beavis and Butthead then. Right. Like, oh, yeah. So, you know, so like I don't want to look old but for us like the og edgy content was you know was that and then south park of course south park was like oh my gosh did you stay up late and watch south park like yeah that actually you know generally had some you know uh, a show with you know generally well-placed uh satire right for the south most Park's part still great south park is yeah, still so, excellent satire and then you get to the boys i think we were i think we were very fair to the boys yeah. uh you know we we acknowledged the good parts right and and the first couple seasons were solid uh, but then three, you know, definitely got worse. Four was just kind of an unwatchable mess. Um, and I honestly have no interest in watching the next season. I I could care less if I ever see another second of The Boys at this point. I don't care how it ends. I don't care what happens to the characters. I have zero investment in the show at this point. So I just found it funny. Two that on that TikTok. <laughs> the yeah. TikTok people get so angry and defensive <laughs> about The Boys. I will say the comments <laughs> actually on our show you guys are spot on. That's why we don't have the plebs. But when we when we actually, yeah. you know, drift out into the the ocean of the plebs, uh, and the masses get to view it. You know, <laughs> the, the are... unwashed, doom scrolling masses. Yes. Yeah. To be fair, yeah. if you've activated the boys or any of the content we discuss on your algorithm, it's probably because you actually like that content. And so hearing us be very disgruntled about it, you know. <laughs> I feel like we do it to hey. ourselves in some ways. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, we got to, you know, the, we are at, you know, at heart, we are commentators, right? 
And commentators have to remain objective. We have to call them like we see them. And that's what we do on this show, too. I feel like we've taken the yep. ethos of sports commentary and we are applying <laughs> it to film and television and saying, yes. this is what is before us. This is what we're reacting to. Uh, we are giving you uh, an unbiased, uh, aside from our own personal biases, opinion <laughs> of things. <laughs> and that's how Doa discovered what film and television criticism was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, see, I'm not saying this for me, though. I'm saying it for for the TikTok fans, right? Or the anti-fans, right? Yeah, really, I we, mean, invented, uh, we invented it. We took esports criticism well, we and then did. we applied it to film, and nobody had ever criticized a film before us. It's true. See, now I know we've spent too much time close to Riot Games when we start to take credit for inventing things like criticism, you know? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's start, as we have been with some of these shows. Uh, Darwin and I did a watch along of the final episode i fucked up the recording so you're not going to be able to watch the whole thing but you can do this little watch along with us now with some of the top moments here you go hey is that a, a mystery targaryen back there <laughs> i feel happy oh so happy <laughs> you were a good man oh wow so you'll probably not live out the season. Sorry, that's how it works in the show. <laughs> I say, can we take down some of the sexy tapestries? I just feel insulted at this point. <laughs> Fucking mad cunt. Hey, that was the name of my punk band in high school. <laughs> my cock is destroyed. Did they tell you that? Yeah. It burst in the flames like a sausage. Wow, they didn't need to tell him that. <laughs> she literally would rather die wandering around in the wilderness than have to take care of... Her siblings. <laughs> this is a fate worse than death. How goes the sea snake? Better than this you. is like the Westerosi version saying, how's it hanging? We'll rejoin the blockade <laughs> on the morrow. But what we need is a king. Ray manpower. <laughs> yeah. Go, go, man. <laughs> bro. <laughs> bro. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Your face and my penis is comforting. <laughs> bro, you're bro, bro. I'm not a bro at all. I was happier before I was queen. Yeah, it's kind of a the the main <laughs> point of the show. This yeah. place. The dragons dance and men are like dust under their feet. Well, we should use that as like the promo line for the show or the book or something. That's a good line. Thanks, Christian. I'm Christian Cole, philosopher knight. <laughs> mud wrestling. That's how we do it. Well, time for some sexy mud a, wrestling. This is this, not this is not provocative at all. This is a Westerosi romantic comedy right here. Doughty ambassador. Doughty. A, doubt, a doughty ambassador. Doughty. Very doughty. I think that was one of your fans in high school. <laughs> doughty, doughty ambassador. ambassador. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Best friends forever. Have you ever eaten the flesh of your enemies? <laughs> <laughs> is, is this Kronos? Did he go meet the Klingons? Like, not many humans can handle Gok. <laughs> All right, that's a good joke. That's actually very funny. <laughs> yes, my lord. <laughs> Again. God, this guy is a fucking terrible shantyist. Boo! Boo this man. Can't shanty. Good, a random dancing scene. This is what I wanted in the season finale. Forget that dragon combat stuff. Let's just do this. I wish to have children by you. Sick. <gasps> Fuck my wives. Tyler's like, wow. I'm in. How many wives do you have? Da -da 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 -da. What could go wrong giving uneducated people immense power? <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong, Duh? Peasants love it when the peasants suffer. A knight will comport himself with grace at the queen's table. Best make me a knight then. Oh, snap. <laughs> That's actually a great line. <laughs> Dialogue's so good, man. <laughs> also, like, basically, if it, your average Reddit commenter became a dragon rider. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> this, this guy escaped from r slash free folk. Yep. <laughs> Just a drunk peasant. Mouth and right. off. It's another disciple of Bobby B. It's a treachery. <gasps> Again. Treachery everywhere. My own uncle <laughs> slash husband. He's not real. I'm going to the God's wood. Get me some of that God's wood if you know what I mean. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Low hanging fruit. So this was some sort of like a Wiccan boot camp, or what, what was this? Mmm, pure maple syrup. Right from the tree. Whoa. Uh, it's it's Raven, Raven again. again. Oh, hey, welcome back. Uh, but no one has a better story than Bran. <laughs> Are they trying to remind us how badly that Game of Thrones series ended? 
Oh, maybe they're just going to redo the... Oh, he's going to go into the future and prevent the bad <laughs> ending from Game of Thrones from oh, happening. Amazing, I know actually, how this... I'm into this. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be sick, yeah. Our mother is not the dragon rider. She's a knight rider. Know what I mean? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Oh. <laughs> 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 it took me a second. I got there. Don't worry. Some kid is just going to flip a knife around and end it all. You know, when everyone hated the ending of Game of Thrones and it was terrible, maybe you don't, you know, try and hype up that time right now. What, what, what happened if he traveled in the it future won't. and just like stabbed Bran in the face? The best, the best <laughs> timeline. I love you, Uncle Husband. <laughs> I am trying to help you. Where are you the rest of my life, Dad? Those do not look like medieval fantasy pillows, I gotta say. <laughs> Those look like they came from Target. Um, yes, but you alone made virtue your banner. And I clung to it. Virtue signaling, it queen bitch. So you stained it. <laughs> Yeah, the OG virtue signaling. <laughs> hey, last season finale, my son died. This season finale, your son dies. It's only it's only fair. Perfectly symmetrical drama. <laughs> <laughs> Never solved anything. I'm so awesome. Power stance. <laughs> I say, I wonder how my brother is doing. <laughs> Lewis is probably wrestling in the mud again. He does so <laughs> love the mud wrestling. <laughs> Whoa, this scene is intense. <laughs> do you like wearing full plate mail on the ocean? I do. Nothing could ever go yeah, wrong if I, I, I fell in. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. I am the acolyte. The power of many. Or many dragons. You're my new best friend. All right. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. You don't get to see the whole thing. Not because of the outrageously Sorry. bigoted things Doe was saying during this episode. <laughs> hey! <laughs> I, th I thought we cut that in good conscience. <laughs> no, it's because uh, it's because I was accidentally recording um, the audio from the episode because I suck at this uh, at the very start. However, most of it was like minutes, remained right? intact. But uh, you guys get yeah. to see a little, little preview of our, our thoughts as the episode was going on. I will not make that mistake in the future you guys already got the acolyte and the boys so we know i can do it right if i feel like it um yeah but you're only human man you're you're only human <laughs> and we have to accept that about you uh oh thank you <laughs> thank you you're welcome um so let's start because i really love this show by saying something mean though about this show because a lot of this <laughs> is me yeah. gonna see be saying very nice things about how this season played out in spite of the fact that the total plebs need apparently needed needed some sort of like fight sequence to end the finale and they couldn't just accept that it's part of a larger story but we'll we'll get to sure. that so i will say i don't find that problematic but i will say some mean things about this show including some of the pacing because i really like all of the interconnected narratives i really like a lot of the relationships that we see in this show but there were a lot of instances where some of these sequences just played out over way too long of a time period even mm. though they did move the plot forward with nuance i did feel like we didn't need the amount potentially of nuance that we got the most egregious of these the most egregious of these is reyna wandering around in the highlands after a unclaimed dragon and all of these sequences that are just her looking at burnt sheep and then like sleeping out in the wilds and like here's how many uh here's about how many of those shots we needed to uh, two uh, we needed one yeah yeah of her looking for the dragon and then one of her finding the dragon not the 10 that we got of her just in the moors being wet and cold her name is Reyna, too. Man, there's too many people with the same name in the show. <laughs> yes, Reyna is the, the daughter uh, who does not have the dragon and who was... Like, I, I thought it was... Wait, I'm terrible with the names in the show. I know. You sure? Right, anyway. <laughs> Am I sure you're bad? Here's, yes. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing, though, is, is that she... I kind of see her as a villain now uh, because she abandoned... Uh, her charges, right? She was she was tasked with caring for Renera's children, the future, the f it's like the future of their family line, and she's just like, yeah, she would be a dragon. I, I mean, yeah, but like, still, you that's an important job, right? Even if there's, she's like, ah, oh, there's other people there, they'll probably be fine. Like, come on, like, even if she finds a dragon, which obviously she did, even if she, you know, becomes the dragon rider, 
she's still abandoned children to an unknown fate, you know? And I feel like that is a very irresponsible thing. I mean, she didn't want to be she didn't want to be a babysitter, Doa, which I think yeah, is, but that's, is completely reasonable. Haven't we uh, learned though from Game of Thrones and the show that ignoring duty is like a big time no no? You know, so we'll see how no, this goes. Nobody ever but... learns that in Westeros. Nobody ever learns that ignoring exactly. duty is that's bad. That's my point. Please Nobody continue. ever learns that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, that that scene went on too long. Like, I actually really like the scenes with Corliss and Allen, but like, dude, how many talking on the dock scenes do we actually need? Well, it's also it's also much like we know Alan doesn't like you, Corliss. Corliss, like, you know, we know you're trying to make a connection here, but obviously that last scene with the two of them, you know, it really, really it was made great. the point where it's like, it's not going to work. It was a great scene, <laughs> but it, it does feel like it's maybe something that's not really going anywhere, you know? Well, the, the, but, again, the problem is, eh. is that we needed two scenes. We needed one where he's like, hey, you're my first mate now. You're my buddy now that my other kids are dead. And then we needed the scene where he rejects him for basically yeah. ignoring him for the whole life. We needed two scenes out of that. We didn't need the 10 scenes that resulted, uh, you know, just standing there on the docks. It did get kind of old. Like, I like mm. I like the nuance again. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff that needs to come in the future obviously is the the situ like my concern doa is that the scene the se series is supposed to be four seasons long and my concern is we have two seasons left and we have a lot mm. it seems like to get through in those two seasons so i'm afraid that it's going to be game of thrones where we get too much crammed into the last two seasons and we traded it for some really Genu like nuanced yeah. but slow character development when it comes to a million doc scenes um, well, or a million Reina scenes wandering around in the hills. It's a very George R. R. Martin thing to have too many characters in the in the story. Um, you know, that's famously in Game of Thrones in the books. They had, I think it was like book what three or four or something that was like just about the minor characters, pretty much. So you know, it, it's it's great to have a big cast in a show like this, but it's very easy to go too big and make too many characters too important. Like, it's okay for some characters to be side characters, right? You know, we don't need, like, uh, you know, hu huge personal growth for every single character in the show. And I, I do worry we're getting to that point now where it's like they've been positioned in a way where, you know, they, they need to be developed more. And, and um, you know, maybe maybe not all of them do. So uh, I agree with you where that is a little bit concerning going to the future seasons that maybe we do have too much, you know? And the last thing I'll call out is Damon's, like, mushroom journey. Uh, you know, hallucina <laughs> is his hallucination. Yeah. How many hallucinations did we actually need? Because I get it's very important that Damon actually goes through this character arc because he has to renounce his claim onto the throne. Because remember, he also has a legitimate claim. The issue mm -hmm. here is that we have so many characters that have legitimate claims that it's actually more, this conflict is presented as two sides, but it's actually more than two sides. Now, having to be more than two sides is interesting, of course, right? Because is he going to try and stake his claim on the throne for his, uh, you know, to take his brother's crown after Viserys' death? Does he want Rhaenyra to have this? And, you know, that is very, I think, you know, well toyed with, right, while he's at Harrenhal. Um, and he has all these visions about his brother and his brother's wishes because that was an unresolved relationship. And I, again, I really love the nuance there. And mm -hmm. we finally get to the point where Alice, you know, the the weird woman that Doe is convinced, like, doesn't actually exist, but definitely does exist. She, de she definitely <laughs> doesn't. She's a figment of his imagination. And did you miss the scene where, like, he's talking to her a little bit and then uh, Lord Simon walks in? And then she passes behind him, but never comes out the other side. And he kind of like looks around, like, like he's confused about uh, who enough. Damon's talking to. Like, uh, I, I think they've, I feel like they've made it fairly obvious that she does not, she's not really there when he's talking to her. That's fair. That's, uh, that's so going to be a big season three reveal. Wait. Anyway, he has the whole three-eyed raven, you know, uh, experience of the future and the song of ice and fire, which, by the way, another mean thing I will say, we did not have to be reminded of because it's that whole plot arc that made people <laughs> super mad in Game of Thrones. And all that yeah. does, guys, is remind me about how shit the end of Game of Thrones is, and that just makes me angry. So we could have just... We, by the way, though, we didn't need that. We didn't need that reveal because the whole... his, his The character arc and his change could have just been brought about by his visions of his brother and his visions of yeah. Rhaenyra and him feeling bad about his brother's wishes and just being like, you know what? 
maybe I'm not the guy for this. Like, we didn't actually yes. have to go into reminding people of all the bullshit at the end of Game of Thrones that people hated. Yeah, I mean, when when we know that all it does is it just ends with Arya Stark flipping a dagger around and stabbing <laughs> the Night King, like, it kind of takes the wind out of all the drama around remembering the Song of Ice and Fire. It's not even a Targaryen that's, that's that stays the day we, we, also, we also got a very terrible Arya Stark sex scene that nobody wanted and is still disturbing to remember. Uh, I, I, I read that apparently that, that actress wanted that, um, you know, hey... <laughs> <laughs> more more power to her, but uh, but yeah, it did seem like it. It was just kind of in there. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was also just super gross because I think everybody who watches that show remembers her as being like, yeah, you 12 think of her as a child at the, at, at the start of the show, and then you're like, oh god, no. <laughs> yeah, it was very uncomfortable. It's like it's like all those it's like all those like Harry Potter fans that would make jokes about Hermione turning 18 or whatever it is, but then they actually like put a sex scene with her in there and I'm like, no, no, we didn't want that. Uh. You know, so it's like it's like that. But it, it, yeah. they actually did it. And you're like, yeah, it's just it is you know what? Regardless of the age of of the actor and her, you know her choices, it is. It felt very uncomfortable to 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 yes. see. You know, again, and being completely unnecessary as a too. child. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and also just completely unnecessary to anything the show was trying to do. You it know, we could have just really deleted that, that scene yeah. and actually had more time dedicated to resolving the plots of Game of Thrones. But anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. So those are some mean things that I could say. I didn't okay. feel like. Those, again, I don't feel like those moments really wasted my time, um, but I will say, like, they leave me concerned that we spent a lot of time on that and will not ha now have time for other more, potentially more important things in the future. That's my, that's my growing, my growing dread, Doa. Sure. Yeah, it's your song of ice and fire. It's your, <laughs> your glimpse of a grim future. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um <laughs> It, you know, if Monty's microphone gets really warm, it, it, it shows like runes that tell a story of, of how uh, the shows that we're watching are going to end badly. It's a uh, I I've been privileged with that information. Now you are too. Yeah. It's it's too bad that Damon to just go in the future and stab Brand in the face. Brand in the face. That hey. would have been the the best the best outcome. <laughs> we'll get into that. We'll we'll get into that. I've got a plan for that. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, uh, like so. Now that we've said some some you know mean things about the show, some some unkind negative things about the show, overall, I think we both really like it. I think yes. uh, uh, I I wasn't as I wasn't as high on season one the first time I watched it through. I watched it again to get ready for season two, and I was like, oh, this is actually great. Um, and then uh, season two was was awesome. I really really enjoyed uh, watching the season. I'm I'm sad it's over. I'm looking for the next one already. So uh, overall, uh, well. Of course, there are negatives. I think that are in there. I think this was this was great, and it was such a such a breath of fresh air after the other things we've been forced to endure on this show. Um, the Rebel Moon director's cut, by the way, coming coming fairly soon. It's I, already out. I think Isn't is it, it already really? out? Yeah, the oh Chalice gosh. of Blood or whatever. I've actually heard it's Chalice a lot better. Of Blood. Well, if you watch the trailer, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, scenes that look like they they weren't in the original one. Um, when is the, the release date? Uh, I mean, it can't actually be good because the premise of the film is really stupid. No, so it's still going to it, be bad for sure. It's still going to be bad for sure. Cause it August can't fix it, it, <laughs> It's out. I know right now. Oh people said it was a lot better than the original, oh. but <laughs> people would say that though. <laughs> Monty's been on TikTok too much. <laughs> All the Zack Snyder <laughs> fanboys slash, you know, like astroturfed hey, Twitter accounts. Hey, Zach. I got a great idea for you. Um, just why don't you just release a good cut the first time? <laughs> Shocking. You know, you can't you can't keep blaming whoever about your bad theatrical cuts or something like that. Like you're the director, man. I, I know the director doesn't have infinite power over their film. Pretty sure he like, does at this point. I would in time think. Yeah, I would movie. think he's big enough to have close to infinite power over his film. So. So why don't you have a good cut the first time? <laughs> Just an idea. Uh, Peter Jackson did it with Lord of the Rings. Sure, the extended editions were great. I loved the things they were they added in for the most part. But uh, the first one, the theatrical cuts were very good too. Yep. Just an idea. Some food for thought. Some uh, some grain for thought, Zach. <laughs> yeah. 
Grain is important. <laughs> yeah, Vitals that's, the, pro the, that's, the, that's yeah. the problem, though, is they can't fix the main plot points, uh, <laughs> and the main plot points are incredibly stupid. I want to see the actual engine of the ship consuming spaghetti or uh, <laughs> mourning the loss of spaghetti. And if you guys Deep are unaware, cut. we actually did do the on this show our version, our our, our reviews of the first two yeah. Rebel Moon. Not our movies. version of it. Not our version, no. Not the it's, not the Monty had, and Joe cut. I would actually just version. cut it entirely from Netflix. Uh, but if you want to watch that, it is pretty funny. Just delete. Uh, okay. <laughs> so find the folder on the Netflix so, server and just hit delete. <laughs> I would love to do that. There. <laughs> Problem solved. If I had three-eyed raven powers, I would alter <laughs> the fabric of reality to delete the existence of those films. There you go. Yeah. Why stop there? But anyway, we'll we'll, we'll move on with uh, with Game of Thrones. I mean, with House of the Dragon. Uh, so I, I predicted in my notes back in episode four that Aemond will kill Aegon and we were so close. We were so close. Um, didn't quite happen, but I feel like that was a pretty good prediction. Maybe it's too obvious, but, uh, you know, what do you think about that? What do you think about the whole thing? Right, so story I mean, we can, we can talk about kind of, kind of the main, a little chronological thing here. Yeah. Know? The, the main plot points that happened, uh, you know, we get, we 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 got the um you know we got the big showdown between uh Aemon and Aegon at least you know when it came to the betrayal that Aemon did to his brother including mm -hmm. incinerating him uh very viciously and so you get the sense obviously that Aemon very much desires to be in control of the realm which is yeah. you know such a great twist you know the brother stabbing each other in the back Aemon getting his revenge for his uh, bullying in his childhood uh, by Aegon. Uh, Aegon also never wanting the crown is very interesting. So I love that family dynamic that's going on around uh, right now. I love the fact that we have Alicent, uh, who's now like kicked off of the council. Um, so, you know, her entire arc, you know, ending at least right now at the end of the season with pleading for Rhaenyra to stop the conflict and basically trying to help her end things, which is really an excellent turn and was one of the, I think the most satisfying parts about the final episode of house of the dragon. Um, so the, the, on the side of the greens in the, in King's landing, like we do have a lot of very cool plot points that are going on right now. Yeah. I mean, we've got that. Uh, speaking of the Allison scene where she shows up, like, I uh, you know this was right after the scene more or less where uh Aemond was like yeah I want every boat checked going in and out of the harbor or whatever let no vessel come or go from our harbor without our inspection and it's like and then we're supposed to believe Alicent just like you know got out of that I guess she's the queen so she could just tell the people checking the boats hey I'm the queen or I used yeah, to be yeah. anyway I'm the queen mother um let's let me through I I guess but I felt like I I felt like the way they snuck Renera into the city for her chat with Alicent earlier uh, was better because there was more tension to it. It seemed more realistic. This she was a bit like, of a deus ex machina for sure. Yeah. And this time she just shows up and you're like, oh, we're just supposed to assume this happened. Everything was fine. Yeah, sure. It could. But, you know, it feels a little bit out of a little bit out of nowhere. You know, and they, they were just like, well, we really need to get these two together to have a conversation. See, again, we apparently. needed more scenes about Reyna wandering in the wilderness rather than setting up Allison's voyage. You know, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> It's apparently the case. I wonder if I would imagine there's probably more shot of that of Allison making her way from King's Landing to uh, to Dragonstone that got uh, that got chopped. So I'll just assume that's out there. Um, but yeah, I didn't mind it that much because it, it, it you know it was the the scene itself was really good between Rhaenyra and Allison and like Allison's character arc has been really interesting because now without her father in the picture. Again, something that I didn't like was just Otto in a cage at the end. It's like, okay, so we just get, he just disappears and then and he's he just in a cage. It's just, okay, well, I, you know, I would have rather seen, again, more of that storyline because I find Otto Hightower really interesting rather than more doc scenes or Damon in his vision quest or uh, Reyna wandering around the wilderness. Um, but we did get that. But I think like 
Allison's entire character arc is fascinating because it's so grounded in Rhaenyra and her being childhood friends. Rhaenyra mm -hmm. make, you know, going into King's Landing and making overtures to Alicent. Alicent then like having all her power stripped away, realizing that her children are extremely violent and dangerous. Like Aegon, you know, they're destroying each other. She now has mm -hmm. absolutely zero control over the situation while Aemond is the regent. And there's not really anything that's going to put a check onto Aemon's like bloodlust on top of that now they're you know the greens are now in a very much a disadvantage in terms of the war because of the dragons that have been accumulated by the blacks over on Dragonstone with Rhaenyra's tactics of finding the new dragon riders and as a result like you realize like she has completely lost control of this situation both personally and politically and mm -hmm. you she needs to get out of that and I love the fact that she is actually willing to and understands that she must sacrifice Aegon for this to happen because she has been behaving, and Rhaenyra accuses her of this, of basically behaving as though she can have her cake and eat it too and trying to play, you know, she doesn't understand the stakes of the game that she's playing, right? Mm -hmm. And the stakes are Aegon absolutely cannot be allowed to live because as long as he lives, even if he's deposed, he always has a valid claim on the throne because in his own mind and in the mind of many people, he will have been the former king and so yeah. he has to die he must die and you know i like the scene where she's saying you have to trade a son for a son right because rhaenyra's son died at the hands of aemon and like that scene itself was really powerful and i think very very well done still you imagine you can have all you want without paying too high a price a price i have no choice what i but want to pay is to set things right i must take Egon's head and i have to do it for all to see you know this choose And this is what I love about this show is the slow burn, because yeah. if we didn't have the relationship that we saw between them as teenagers in in the first season, all the way leading up to, you know, Rhaenyra trying to appeal to her and now her appealing to Rhaenyra and all of, you know, all of the events that have happened. We don't have the same level of weight to these moments where it really does feel like momentous weight you know, of their history, because we've seen that history now between the two of them, and it really works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's so many, I, I feel like it's harder to go through this season chronologically, and it's easier to go through this season in terms of talking about character little arcs. subplots with each yeah. character. Yeah, the character arcs, right? So um, I let's, let's talk about Damon's next, uh, because he was, I feel like his character arc was kind of the main secondary arc maybe even just sure. the main character arc of this season right where he had to come to grips with you know he's just not meant to be king you know uh for whatever reason and he has to come face to face with all the horrible things he's done over the years and kind of pursuit of of this power he's that he wasn't meant rash. to have and all that yeah exactly yeah and, and sort of maturing and you know it's i don't think you can ever it's hard to root for Damon because he's done a lot of really horrible things, uh, like like most people in the show have. Just some light but, uh, genocide, some light war crimes, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But, you know, so it's hard to really feel sorry for him when bad things happen to him. But it is uh, compelling to watch this character, you know, face his past and change. And then finally, you know, in the last episode, you know, the really, I, I would say the the climax of this season is that, you know, he, he seems to truly pledge himself to Rhaenyra, you know, in a, in a, with a level of sincerity that we haven't seen from him before in this. Um, and it's like, you're very, you're really not sure what he's going to do at the end, you know, but I think, uh, talking to a, a tree and some magic birds and a ghost lady, uh, really had a big effect on him. And, uh, well, and it was a good one. I am meant to serve you and all of these with me until death or the end of our story. You know, it was, it was, you know, a personal revelation. And like, I think that, I, again, I was not bored with all of the, the sequences at Heron Hall of Damon kind of confronting his internal demons. No, again, I didn't mind those at all. I like those. It's mostly yeah. just that the number of them 
potentially could have been used. I, I am, I, you know, if they stick the landing on this show, it's not going to matter how many of those scenes they did, right? Because I do sure. think that they are individually useful. And I think a lot of the Heron Hall scenes in general are super interesting. Like, I really, uh, you know, I really liked what Damon was doing. You know, the fact that he left in a huff. Like, if we just track his character arc this season, he started that incredibly harebrained assassination plot where he just yeah. left it to some idiots and then they killed the wrong kid, um, which then caused a, you know, a crisis for Rhaenyra. And she got mad at him, realized that he was too rash, kicked him out. What does he then go do? He inserts himself into a conflict between two minor noble houses and basically just gives this the one on Rhaenyra's side uh, carte blanche to commit these atrocities, which of course <laughs> then like disrupts the political landscape of the Riverlands and the Riverlords understandably get quite pissed because like they don't want that shit going on there because obviously you don't want that level of unrest and you don't want the regent coming in and saying like, oh yeah, war crimes, totally cool. Just like do those if you're on our side, right? Um, and there's a sense of honor among these people too. And I, I really yeah. liked, uh, you know, all of that. Um, this was all, I also really liked, you know, it has been, it has been, you know, a humbling of Damon. I think it's been very successful because it's not only about the Rhaenyra stuff. It was about the stuff with his actions in the Riverlands and Oscar Tully, this kid basically like handling this political situation, like really fucking well. And yeah. that scene, kind of wrecked him, yeah. yeah, that scene with Damon and, and Oscar Tully and the Riverlords is fucking great guys. It is yeah. so good where he basically, you know, is, is saying like, oh, well, Damon, you have to take responsibility for this. And the, the way you do that is by killing the guy you kind of just, you know, winked and nodded at to say, oh, yeah, you sh should go do these horrible things. But, he, mm -hmm. you know, Oscar's the Oscar Tully's right. Like the, the, the Lord didn't have to do that. He chose, you know, to be that brutal. I did only what his grace, the king, required of me. It is true, but you did not have to pursue such savagery. You did it because you wanted to. Our young lord speaks truly. In terms of the way that he was waging war and he had to be punished. Um, but th this is the cost of getting the alliance that they need in order to have the army that they need to actually fight. Um, and, you know, you do get the sense of the the legacy of honor in the Riverlands, because not only the way the river lords are behaving, but because of the fact that you know, Oscar Tully says he is going to honor his grandfather's vow and that a vow means something. So, like, mm. you really get this really amazing, rich texture to the world and the characters. But you also get Damon understanding, I think, slowly over time that he himself is not even particularly good at making political decisions or or ruling. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think he fully comes to terms with that, which is very interesting. Like, he is charismatic but he's a blunt instrument that needs to be wielded by somebody else. And when he wields himself, it is disastrous. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like he's, we know from his, his time, like in season one, you know, organizing the gold cloaks and, and kind of, you know, bringing down crime in the city, even though through brutality, like he's, yeah. he's good at gathering a, he's good at community building. We'll say, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's he's not good at large scale rule. He's not good at the, the decision making minutia no, of he's, politics. He's you just know? very he's just very blunt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like his his as that's a great point though. I had forgotten about that. But his when he was in mm -hmm. charge of the, the city watch, he basically just went and did a, a, a violent, you know, a violent, you know, night against crime where they they just dispensed mob justice with the basically the city police. Um yeah. so yeah, it, it, he doesn't have long plans. He's like the the world of Westeros's first influencer, basically. You know, <laughs> he's he's famous and and community building, but uh, you know, not not maybe the best uh, person to be led by per se. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, he yeah. wants the quick win every time. Yeah. Like he doesn't. He doesn't. He's not like Otto Hightower, who is thinking long term about mm. how. The butterfly effect could happen. He wants the most. He wants to be immediately gratified. He wants instant gratification, and he's like, well, "I can solve this problem really fast." Oh, there it goes. Just hire some thugs, and it's done. It's like it's not well, done. <laughs> it's it's funny because you mentioned Otto Hightower, and I I feel like everyone who's scheming in this show gets their schemes kind of thrown back in their face, and Otto might be more subtle, and he might be trying to think further ahead. 
but his method of scheming is is equally self-destructive in the end because he his method of scheming is I'm going to sit in the back and I'm going to influence things so I have this person here and I have this person here and I have this person here in this position I'm placing everywhere everyone I everyone in a place I want them to be but he neglects to realize that once you put someone there uh that you've manipulated into a certain place they're probably not as smart as you are, right? If you've been able to manipulate to them. <laughs> well, if you've been able to manipulate these people and put them in these places, they're not as smart as you are. And so they're going to be in those places, but they're going to start making dumb decisions, which will then <laughs> derail your plans. So he he managed to maneuver, you know, Aegon to become king, essentially, and all these other things to happen. But then all the people he placed in different places were those people and they just were, they just made bad decisions, you know, because again, like these are people who are not as smart as him. He manipulated it, them into these positions successfully. But then the problem is, is you can't be babysitting these people that are easily manipulated all the well, time. And so they're going to start going off and making their own bad decisions, you know? It's not just that, but like they don't want to be told what to do anymore. And his plan requires them on being told what to do because they need to follow right. his directions. So that's why he played he... on their egos and vanity. And yeah. so <laughs> well, that's not going to work once you actually give them a taste of power. So it feels like his methods are are different from Damon's, but you know, in a sense, equally self-destructive, right? Um, you know, you, you could argue that his his uh, interference into everything was a major contributor to this whole mess starting to begin with, you know? Trying to place Alicent in a position where, you know, her and her and Viserys would get together, right? Back in season one. Uh, that was that was pretty much Otto that, that made that happen, you know, which led to all this kind of stuff. So he is sort of the catalyst of, of everything that's happening in the show. For the most part, Damon being kind of the other one, they are kind of the two people that have created all these ripple effects. So it's interesting to look at their methods side by side and see the similar consequence, but different uh, methodology, you know? Yeah, I think we should also talk about the storyline with the new Dragon Riders, because that's been the other thing is like basically what you're seeing is everybody just gearing up for this war. Um, whether it's in terms of armies with Damon at Harrenhal or the Greens who are, you know, marching from Casterly Rock and Old Town. And then you have, uh, you know, this these kind of unattended dragons and this plot that they hatch to see because they don't understand, you know, nobody understands really why the dragons, you know, behave like they do to certain people and allow certain mm -hmm. people to ride them. And so you get this scenario where... Um, you know, they, they are trying to concoct and they think, oh, well, maybe it's the blood. And I do think it's very it's a very savvy take, especially um, from Viseria, the new kind of commoner advisor to Rhaenyra slash lover of Rhaenyra, where she says, like, well, I know where all of these like half, you know, half blood Targaryens are. Why don't we just collect some of those from King's Landing, which is a really fun idea. And it's a yeah. really fun plot line. And it also just obviously sets up these characters that we I wouldn't say no, but they have these characters have said like, oh, I'm actually like secretly a Targaryen, um, you know, a, a, of Targaryen descent. Um, and so that's how we get Ulf and Hugh into uh, Dragonstone as they put out the call, you know, to get to have all these people basically audition to, you know, who may be Targaryen to audition to become dragon riders. And then we also get um, what's his name? Adam, uh, Alan's brother, Corliss's illegitimate son, who mm. takes over. Um, his actual, you know, his legitimate son's dragon. So it's, you know, Adam is his half brother. Um, uh, you know, so probably obviously because they were half brothers, the dragon could sense that and allowed Adam yeah. to, to ride him, which I think is a very cool plot line. Like that one is, that one feels really good. And I like the fact that with the new dragon riders, we're getting kind of a mix of these commoners um, you know, with the nobility and what does that mean? And also it really drives the Jaceris plot line forward because he's also a bastard. And I think he has mm -hmm. a really good point when he's talking to Rhaenyra where he says like, well, you know, doesn't that, you know, doesn't that delegitimize my claim on the throne? And you do wonder, Doa, if you're getting all these dragon riders who have Targaryen blood and they're half Targaryen and then Jaceris is also only half Targaryen are we accidentally setting up the next succession crisis right is this like you yeah know, that's, you know and yeah. that's a, that's a fascinating point and another layer of like the interest and intrigue to this show that I really enjoy yet I may argue my legitimacy to succeed you because I have a dragon and now you say you'll strip that from me too 
Yeah, and you know it's it it's interesting too because you know you could say oh well you know Jake's got a, a better claim because he's directly uh, Rhaenyra's son, you know. But at the same time, there's all these like uh, you know direct sons of Viserys, Viserys out there, right? Yeah, so it's like or Viserys' uh, dad. They're they're like Viserys' half yeah. brother. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, so so uh, you know it's it's uh, at the end of the day, you know, is it is it might or is it blood? You know that makes for the the proper claim, and and we'll see, I guess, what what happens. But in the end, it doesn't matter because Arya Stark does a knife flippy trick and uh, kills the Night King anyway. So, uh, <laughs> you know, ultimately, uh, we didn't even need a, a prince who was promised. Um, we just needed Arya Stark and her uh, flippy knife trick. Yeah. <laughs> that she that she yeah. learned in like, you know, ten too many scenes of of being in Bravos. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. she learned to become a master assassin, which I think is a cool arc for that character. Um, if they did anything with it, it would have been. But cool. uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like it kind of got started in the book, but never really got ended because that book hasn't been written yet. Um, but the in the show, they just sort of were like, "Well, yeah, we'll just have her use her ninja skills to." Kill Look, I agree. Her arc was incredibly cool. If they had done anything with it, it could yeah, have been exactly. cool. Exactly. Exactly. Like the yeah. the journey was cool. The the end was definitively uncool. Well, also just making a, all the, the whole song of ice and fire, the entire thing, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's so funny to, that it's so hard to talk about a show in the game of Thrones universe without, uh, just going back and complaining about game of Thrones. Like the ending was that bad that it's still affecting it, well, but it, it's, you know, it, the knowing what happens in the future, according to that series really does color your thoughts of everything in this series no, too, the, that ultimately, the, and you don't even need the Targaryens. They, the prince who was promised didn't matter. The, the problem though, is not that game of Thrones happens in the future. It's that they try and shoehorn in all this prophecy to make what happens in the future feel really important. But we, as a viewer, know that it wasn't really important yeah. so it just feels like shit i mean it feels like shit because because if it had been epic if there had been an epic ending in the last two three seasons of game of thrones we mm -hmm. could totally buy into this moment in house of the dragon of like oh yeah listen to the prophecy like the white walkers are dangerous and this is what everything is coming to you know hundreds of years right. of of visions and, and leadership but unfortunately it, it ended in such a satisfying fashion that and such an unepic fashion that when we're reminded of it, it just feels really bad. Like the 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 armies of the uh, the Night King or whatever it is, uh, they yeah. didn't even make it out of the north. <laughs> they didn't get they didn't get anywhere really, you know. So it was just it was profoundly disappointing. And so yeah, it does take the wind out of a lot of uh, yes. wind out of the sails of a lot of the you know look forward to the future prophecy kind of stuff because we know it just ends stupid. <laughs> so. Uh, what what can you do, right? But uh, um, you know, this show is good enough; it doesn't need it. This show doesn't need to rely on uh, reminding us that it's connected to Game of Thrones to be good. Uh, you know, we don't; we really don't need that. Uh, we think the the tar as viewers for House of the Dragon, like the tar the Targaryen family, the succession war that's going on, that's all interesting enough uh, on its own that we don't need to be constantly reminded of like, oh yeah, there's this other thing that's going to happen in 200 years or so. And this is connected to it. Like, you know, you can throw that in there once or twice, but like, we don't, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really, it's not important for the purposes of, of enjoying this show, but uh, mo moving on with other arcs, uh, who do we have to cover yet? Um, uh, Laris, I guess. Uh, Lord I love Laris. Laris's arc. I think it's great. Yeah. He's he's been very interesting, but towards the end of the season, like I you almost wonder about him a little bit too, because like suddenly he kind of like flips and now he's really trying to just protect Aegon. And uh, you know, is it does he really feel like uh, you know, allying himself with Aegon and spiriting him away secretly is really the best move for him to like advance himself, like has been his goal for the entire show so far? Or is it just he feels the sympathy for this person that is now crippled and disfigured um and so he's going against his normal uh playbook to you know help this person like it's it's kind of hard to say because i feel like if you i feel like Aegon isn't really you know ever going to be a real contender for the king again so in that sense it doesn't make sense why laris would do all this stuff for him but on the other side like i said you know if he he feels sympathy for this person now then maybe that does justify it what, what's your take on that I mean, look, I, I think Laris's arc is extremely interesting. And like, I don't know where this is going, but 
I feel like at least in Game of Thrones, you know, the equivalent of of Peter Baelish, like Baelish was interesting at first, but he basically, mm-hmm. you know, it got, it got too much in terms of like he was just controlling everything ridiculously yeah, by the kind of yeah. end of the arc. And it was really overwrought. What I like about Laris is like he's very understated. And I'm curious, you know, especially as he spirits Aegon out of the city, because I mean, he's absolutely right. Aegon is in danger. I mean, I have a lot of questions about Laris's motivation, like why mm-hmm. he's trying to prop up Aegon, who is a, a weak king and what he thinks he can get, because he's trying to take him outside of Westeros. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my question is for in in Laris's case, why is he doing that instead of, you know, potentially just killing Aegon and manipulating Aemond instead? And right, for me, right. for me, there's a, you know, perhaps he feels actual like legitimate pity because Aegon is crippled now and therefore like him and he wants to help mm-hmm. him. That's a possibility like that. I think that card is still definitely on the table. But I am really compelled by this because he seems to have a motivation that isn't power. And I don't know what that is. I, the I kind of wonder too if maybe he looks at Aemon and it's like, well, this guy is too vengeance minded, too military minded. Sure. He's not prone to the same type of manip- manipulations that I'm good at. So I need to make sure Aegon lives because he's technically the king. And so I need to stick with this guy because I need this guy to get back into power eventually. Because sure, Aemon but why not, not just be- betray not him a- and help Rhaenyra if he thinks Rhaenyra is going to win the war? Like maybe he's going to do that. No, I don't Rhaenyra. know. Like the you know the, there is a world by the way where. He's literally just taking Aegon to Rhaenyra right now. Yeah, that's that's totally. Oh, that's a good possibility. Oh, that's <laughs> that is maybe a possibility. I hadn't thought of that. That's that makes a lot of sense. A lot too, of actually. you guys who know the source material oh. probably be like, no, guys. But I mean, that's yeah. Part of the we fun we of haven't read show. the book. We haven't read the book, so we don't know. But um, I think it all comes down to who has the sexiest feet uh, for Laris <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, Aegon, sure, maybe he's partially uh, incinerated, but, you know, maybe maybe some of the, maybe one of his feet still looking good. I don't know. Um, you know, that's, I feel like that's something that we were shown about Laris and then just kind of like never revisited. Not that I was dying to revisit that about Laris, but I thought it was funny that that was like made a significant point about his thing that he's like, he, he wants to manipulate people but really wants to just look at feet. <laughs> <laughs> he's another one of our, our, uh, our uh, Reddit uh, commenters come to life but uh um you know but then they kind of just discard that where it's like eh, yeah maybe we didn't need to like focus on the foot fetish part of uh, laris's character which <laughs> you know i'm i'm okay with if we never go back to that it won't be the end of the world for me but uh but one does wonder whenever he's doing something how foot motivated is this decision you know like so that. anyway that's laris <laughs> <laughs> uh it's, let's see i mean i I really uh, loved uh, Corliss's and Rhaenys's, uh relationship throughout this show. I'm sad Rhaenys is gone because I thought their re- relationship and their marriage was was uh, such a, a interesting part of the show. Sure. Um, in that, like, they were both fiercely loyal to each other, really genuinely in love. It seemed like, which is a rarity in this show, right? Uh, to have a couple that's like really partners as well as romantically involved, right? Like a real solid marriage, it seemed like, and. They hated decisions the other one made at multiple times during the series, but they still both had this fierce loyalty to each other. Um, and so then, you know, now seeing where Lord Corliss goes now that Renice is gone is going to be interesting because it's kind of that situation where it's like when that person is suddenly gone from your life, what do you do with yourself? You know, and we see him sort of starting to look for, you know, family connections elsewhere because, you know, both his kids are dead as far as he knows. We know Lenor's still out there somewhere probably partying having a good time he's like one of the he's one of the characters that got away in this series you know where it's like oh he's he's out there not having to worry about any of this anymore so it's good for him but corliss you know has now essentially lost his entire family aside from some grandchildren right so you know then he goes and starts to try to pal around with his bastards it doesn't you know go well so he is it to use nautical terms he is a ship adrift uh Mm -hmm. and i'm curious to see where his character is going to go because it's a it's a neat character so yeah, and I, I like the fact that, you know, he is, re- you know, Corliss is reevaluating his life because he has lost his wife and his children with her. And now he's like on to his bastards and he doesn't, you know, really care about, doesn't really care about his grandchildren because he knows they're not really his grandchildren, right? Um, right. Sure, sure. 
but like, uh, is it, you know, and he's, and he's obsessed with legacy as well. So it makes sense that he would try to get close to his bastards now. And, and, yep. you know, in theory to try to set one of them up to inherit Driftmark or whatever, you know, which is what he's trying to do with Alan and Alan's just rejecting him. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess you got to go for the dragon rider now, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Corliss's arc is also super interesting. I mean, this is why all the storylines are good. I, I just don't yeah. understand why people are complaining about this show, Doa, because I find all of the conversations really interesting. I think the dialogue is extremely well-written and there's a lot of nuance and subtlety to character motivations and the political situation that's going on. It's very interesting to discuss. I... I will admit, and uh, and maybe we can use our, our, our segment not like this for this. We'll we'll do that. We'll make this a not like this segment. And uh, yeah, I will say, not like this in in terms of I did want the I I wish that the highest point of action in the finale wasn't mud wrestling. <laughs> um, that was a, an entertaining scene, sure, but like. You know, I and I know this is a very dialogue driven, it's a very politics driven show and all that, but they they do the dragon action so good in this show. I wanted a little bit more of that. In a season finale, I wanted I wanted a little bit of, of physical action there. And and not getting any of that, no battles, no cool dragon moments. Um, you know, I uh, I I was a little bit disappointed. So I know I know you disagree, and and for the most part, you know, I think it's fine if this is a a setup episode for the next season. But it didn't feel it didn't feel very finale. It it ended on such oh. a, a a kind of a cliffhanger setup sort of note, and that that was a little bit of a letdown so, for me. Not a huge one, but a little bit. There have been rumors that this show was supposed to be ten episodes this season instead of eight, mm. which would actually make a lot of sense because obviously the setup that yeah. we're getting, Doa, is we're getting the battle between this we're getting a naval combat right like they're setting up for the naval fights uh between the greens and the blacks and that's going to be the next piece of action and i think a lot of people probably think well that's what this should have ended on i like you. auto i like auto high tower tend to take the uh -huh. long view of these things you guys who criticize this you're all damon targaryen targaryen <laughs> wanting this to be the most blunt you know immediate instant gratification that you could possibly get i yeah. on the other hand am auto hightower i am seeing all of these plot lines and ultimately do it it doesn't matter if there's a break between these two seasons because when the action comes it's going to be glorious and they've done such sure. a good job setting it up that by having all of these moments we are actually going to get more impactful action in the end like you can't both complain about the end of game of thrones which rushed the ending and rushed the action you know, I rushed to, to get the action set pieces in there and then say that House of the Dragon isn't doing right. By the way, those are wait, the same people. Wait, wait, those are wait the same fucking second. people. Wait a second. Wait a second. So so you can't say we can't be disappointed there wasn't a big moment of action while simultaneously saying I think there were too many uh, of the same scene of setups that could have been cut down. Like, guess what they so, could have done with that extra time? They could have put in a finale action kind of so, thing. So it doesn't. It, so first off, I don't see it as meaningful as to whether this season ends with action or the next season starts with action. That is completely irrelevant to me because the sure. only thing that matters is how impactful that action becomes. And like I said, I don't have a problem. I do not have any problem with all of these scenes that were used for character development if they have enough time to satisfactorily finish the rest of the show. Sure. My criticism well, we'll is see. entirely contingent on what happens in the next two seasons. Hey, well, you know, at the end of the day, if we're going to compare Otto and Damon, you know, Otto's the one who ended the season in a cage. Uh, Damon's out there, like, talking to tree spirits and ghosts and things. So. I, look, man, I feel like a lot of people cool on TikTok, TikTok wish I was in a cage like Otto. So <laughs> you You're go. in a cage of your own uh, curmudgeon views on uh No, on it's not a curmudgeon scenes. view. Yeah. Uh, I, I, am taking the, I am taking the real view here, which is that oh, there real. were a lot of really good scenes in the finale. Oh. There are a lot of really sure. good scenes. Um, we, you know, we didn't talk about the scene between Gwen and, and Kristen, where you really got a lot of the oh, dimension yeah. of, you know, what it feels like to be without a dragon and kind of just a, a, a soldier in the middle of this conflict. And, mm -hmm. you know, Kristen basically saying, like, why don't I just die? Which is not unreasonable <laughs> if you think about it. It's not unreasonable. Like, his life that is was pretty a great shit. Scene. We march now toward our annihilation. 
to die will be a kind of relief. Don't you think? Um, it's very you know, Shakespearean. You, get, you, you also get Aemond, uh, who is, you know, he is involved in his own potential, like, war crimes at this point in time, right? With Vagar. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you get more, uh, you, you get Ulf's character fleshed out in those scenes with Rhaenyra, like Ulf and Hugh's characters, which I think is very interesting. Mm. Um, you know, his kind of boorish, I mean, he's a, he's a drunk, uh, he's an idiot. Uh, he accidentally got a dragon as we know from being a coward basically, <laughs> which is funny, right? Yeah. Uh, the difference between I, I love him, him and Hugh is, is, is wonderful. Like that contrast is wonderful. Well, he was such um, you, a typical, like, uh, you know, valiant knight character. He saves a maiden and and uh, tames a dragon, and <laughs> Ulf just uh, runs away and and uh, gets lucky. It's like the dragon yeah. felt sorry for him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you also get the the really good Alice and Rhaenyra scene. Um, you get Damon, you know, pledging his fealty, and it's like this. All this, the, the end of the season is really just setting up all of the pieces beautifully on the board, and mm -hmm. people are just mad because they they want some sort of action set piece as opposed to an actual satisfying action set piece. Which it doesn't really matter whether it happens now or next season, because no one at the end of the day, Doa, no mm -hmm. one is going to fucking remember if this show delivers where that break point was, and if you watch it in the future. Sure. You, you you just, you know, if, if you watch this, you know, five years from now, where one season ends and the other, you know, begins is irrelevant. Yeah, but I'm so, watching it right now, Monty. And right now in this care? moment, right now in this moment, it feels what? like I watched Goku power up for like an hour. And then right before he goes Super Saiyan, it just says next time on Dragon Ball Z, does Goku go <laughs> Super Saiyan? I'm like, yes, I know he does. I wanted to see it now. I don't want to have to wait for another episode. That's what we're at, right? Set up. And but no the payoff. setup's so good. The setup's so good that I you sure. don't you don't need the payoff right now. You're you're not wrong, but I'm I was going like to be edging little, little for payoff. another two. I'm going to be little... edging for another two years. Could be great. I knew you were going to go there, but <laughs> I, I want a little bit of payoff. A little bit of payoff. No, I can't. No, I can't stand the the two years of edging. I am who I am. What can I say? Two years well. is a long time. <laughs> But it's a uh, I you know you you mentioned Cole I just love his arc where it's like the fall from grace and then finally getting the point where he's just like, geez like I thought I was cool because I was like a king's guard and like the biggest thing my family had ever done but like those those dudes have dragons I I'm nothing you know I'm I'm basically just like I'm chaff you know and to have that uh, that utter uh, you know utter uh, despondency at the end I, I'm curious to see where his character's going here but but yeah. The dragons dance, and men are like dust under their feet. And all our fine thoughts, all our endeavors are as nothing. Yeah. Um, I had to add that on for, for Cole, because you mentioned him. Um, oh, one thing I really liked that the show did, especially uh, around Alicent, where she's kind of like, everything's happening, and she feels out of control. If you're using headphones to listen to the show, they put like a very low sort of like rumble in the background, uh, in the audio, uh, as you know, in, if she's just standing in a room feeling tense, there's this very low rumble kind of going on in the audio too. And like that, that feels so much like stress, like the way your head feels when you're very stressed out. I will admit I've been stressed out at times in the past and you really do feel like you're, this rumble is happening kind of, right? So I thought that was such an accurate mm. portrayal of just extreme stress and uh, i thought that was a, a really neat audio addition they had into the in the show i will add one uh we'll, we'll have a couple more segments guys i will add one more yeah. of fake drama and Doa, this it. this instance of fake drama is definitely something that could have been removed from this episode in favor of i don't know the real naval battle because it is completely mm. ridiculous fake drama that thailand goes to this island and then yeah. he has to, we have this scene of them talking about whether they're going to help him or not which is completely fake drama because they just end up helping him and he's not even uh -huh. a good fighter guys but he has to mud wrestle a woman <laughs> which is like literally the it's like she she looks like gender swap dario noharis from from game of thrones like when well, first time i saw that character i was like dario and i'm like wait is this like Dario's like great 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 grandmother or something like it's uh the but, the resemblance is uncanny. But 
the thing the thing Doa is that we could have just had this scene where Tylen goes he's like yo help us here's some money and they're like okay and then they just do it but instead we have this uh -huh. fake drama of are they gonna help them are they not gonna help them oh we gotta wrestle this woman of course in the mud it's not explained why they have to mud wrestle right they could have just like I don't know fought with swords on normal ground or like punched you had a boxing match yeah, no we have to know. have them the ridiculous mud wrestling into here's a feast because you won and all of a sudden even though she was previously insulting his manhood apparently by the way no one on that island can actually beat up a woman which i find to be you know just completely unbelievable <laughs> uh she's like he's like the strongest man she's ever seen and now all of a sudden he's a good sea captain because he beat her up on land what the fuck is I, that and then he, and then she's like know. would you like to impregnate my wives and he's like oh i want you to fuck my wife How many words do you have? And, and that's it. <laughs> By the way, we could, have done with, we could have done with exactly none of that, and we could have just had the sea battle. So I would say yeah, the, fake, yeah. the fake drama is absolutely outrageous in the last episode around that. Yes. Why did we need the the Tylen Lannister comedy arc? It was, it's like it's like the people were they were writing the last episode, and the writers were like, "Well, you know what? I really love I I love it when a Star Trek character, one of the human Star Trek character, goes and hangs out with the Klingons. Those episodes are hilarious to me. So we're yeah. gonna do that in That's Game true. of Thrones, but it's gonna be Tylen Lannister with the the uh, uncouth in his eyes people of the the free cities. It's gonna be hilarious. Well, just wait. well, it, it, it's also like we didn't have any connection to the the people that they were talking to and then right. also we didn't even really have an arc with tylen like tylen's been on the council but that's it he's yeah. been a super minor character and they also didn't play up that he's the master of ships but he's not really a sailor which like we learned kind of in this episode which was very weird mm. Um, you know, if they want to build up, they do. Th my point is, they've done such a good job of building up these other characters that not only do we just not need Thailand as a major character, like having his own fucking scenes, but we definitely don't need these scenes. These scenes are ass. Well, it's kind of I kind of got the feeling where it's like, well, it's a Lannister. People recognize that name from Game of Thrones. Yeah. So we got to do this. But but then it's also he also becomes sort of the. Uh, the punching bag for everybody that was mad at the Lannisters in Game of Thrones, where it's like, haha, look at the Lannister get humiliated and beat up. Doesn't that make you feel good because you didn't like the Lannisters in Game of Thrones? It's, you know, I, I kind of feel like there's a little bit of that too, but but do we need any of it? No, absolutely not. Um, were those scenes like really silly and ridiculous, kind of like out of nowhere? Yeah. Um, could we maybe have replaced all that with an awesome naval battle? For sure. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Also, no, I guess, uh, I guess we got to wait. The, I, I was going to put this out there. Okay. If, if it's this yeah. island's tradition that if you beat up a woman, you get to have a bunch of sex, like everybody Jeez. would be going there. I'm just going to say that everybody would be going there. <laughs> to be a famous island, I guess. But... <laughs> It'd be a very famous island. Yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on there. It was just a, you know, it's just a special <laughs> offer for Thailand Lannister, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what was going on with that scene. Like, is he just comedy relief now? Is he? It was terrible. Is he the Jar Jar Binks of, of this it, show it, from it now is, on? Like, it is definitely the low point of House of the Dragon. And like, absolutely, I, if you're yeah. gonna get mad at any of the scenes for stealing time from what could have been the epic naval battle between, uh, you know, the Sea Snake and the alliance between the Triarchy and. Uh, and the Lannisters, like, get mad at that scene. That scene is terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Could have done it much faster, much more different, uh, much less mud, mud wrestling. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what was happening there. That was the action sequence you wanted, right? Though I like that's what that everybody was, wanted. That was the only action sequence <laughs> in that episode. Think think about it. The season finale and our, our season finale action sequence is Tyler Lannister mud wrestling with a character we've never met before uh, five minutes ago, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on. Like like I said, it was it felt like it felt like one of those silly uh, Enterprise crew person with the Klingons <laughs> uh, situation and and you know, it works there because it you've was got it, truly the, the Deep Space Nine Ferengi episode of, uh, of House of the Dragon. <laughs> you <laughs> like the those, Ferengi episodes, though. Funny. You, you're a, those are actually funny. <laughs> you're an admitted Ferengi enjoyer. I am. Uh, I am so. That's true. I, it's true. <laughs> I am. I am an admitted I, Ferengi enthusiast. <laughs> you know, I think the Deep Space Nine episodes are, are better than the TNG episodes for sure. But, um, you know, oh, I don't know if percent. I can. 
because we actually care about the, the thing. Enjoyer. The thing about the thing about the Ferengi episodes in Deep Space Nine, though, is you actually care uh-huh. about like Quark and Rom. You don't yeah, care course, about yeah. you don't care about Tyland or what's her name, <laughs> the That's Admiral. True. Like, <laughs> so I just, mean, the Lannisters. Funny. <laughs> the the Lannisters, you know, being obsessed with with uh, you know uh, money and commerce, just like the Ferengi are as well. <laughs> like, I mean, the Lannisters are really the Ferengi of the Game of Thrones universe, I suppose. What do you think no about it? No wonder I so, love Tywin so much. <laughs> you know, no wonder that actor's ears are so large. I guess. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Sorry, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jefferson Hall. You're you have very normal uh, ears, perhaps, but uh, the joke was out there. Uh, but yeah, that was really weird, huh? I guess we've discovered something really important on the show today that the the Lannisters are the Ferengi of the Game of Thrones universe, huh? The more you know. Well, uh, on that note, I have one final section uh, from my side of things today. Uh-huh. One final segment. Um, and that, that segment is uh, Can It Cross Over? Uh, and uh, a segment I, I have a, a great fondness for. And I think we've got a really good one this time around. And, and it, only, it only really deals with one character here. Um, but it deals with uh, perhaps the most important character, which is Matt Smith and his portrayal of uh, Prince Daemon Targaryen. Uh, we have this theory, if you watch the watch along, we talk about this, and I think it's very accurate. That's where this kind of comes from, is that he has these, Damon has these visions of the future and all that kind of stuff. And we posited, what if that meant that, uh, Prince Damon Targaryen, uh, tried to go to the future to prevent the bad ending of Game of Thrones from happening. But in the process of traveling there, he accidentally went too far in the future and came out in Europe in uh, the you know early 1900s or so, and ended up becoming Prince Philip in uh, in in The Crown, right? Also played by Matt Smith. And guess what? It goes even farther. He also plays uh, Queen's Consort, you know, so a King <laughs> Consort. So he's uh, and it goes even farther than that. He even is an aerial combatant <laughs> as an Air Force pilot in uh, in The Crown. So I'm convinced at this point that Prince Philip in The Crown is actually Daemon Targaryen, who has gone too far forward in time as he was trying to prevent the bad ending from the Game of Thrones TV show. If you look at their mannerisms, they're very similar. If you look up uh, Prince Philip quotes from real life, you will notice a certain uh, similarity of personality that that exists there, I will say. Um, a certain, perhaps, uh, desensitivity towards the people around him. And bluntness? <laughs> yes, that's right. But but sort of a uh, sort of a comedic self-awareness about it, too, perhaps, we could put there. But but yeah, um, I'm convinced that uh, Prince Philip in, in The Crown and Daemon Targaryen are the same person. So absolutely, in my opinion, there's no question that uh, the that the crown and Game of Thrones are in a shared universe. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yes. I, I love it. Uh, it. It does make sense. The three eyed raven just manipulating space time to just send yeah, him into the future. Yeah, uh, it's very obvious. Yeah. Uh, the, the sad thing, though, is that they didn't send him far enough in the future to actually you know, stop the, the showrunners from ruining That's, the end of Game of Thrones. That would have been the best. They went too far. <laughs> they went too went far. Too far. <laughs> it went all the way to, like I said, he went all the way to Europe in the early 1900s. Um, you know, same as uh, struggles with infidelity. We'll throw that one in there too. <laughs> like there's, there's, there's a lot. That's there's true. a lot of, it's, it's a true. lot of similarities. I like it. <laughs> I like it. It's a um, lot of similarities. It's eerie. Eerie, so, in fact. Yeah. No, before we end, uh, they did announce a new Game of Thrones show that's going to start next year, no. which is N- Night of the Seven Kingdoms, which is based off of the Dunk and Egg novellas. So while people are complaining, oh, we're not going to have you know Game of Thrones until 2026, probably true yeah. because it hasn't started filming yet, so it's definitely not going to be done for another two years. Uh, but especially because we know there are going to be these big battles. The CGI is going to take a bunch of time. The dragons, by the way, look amazing in House of the Dragon. Oh, like, the, dragons the, are... the effects are fucking great. Dragons um, are some of the best characters in this show, honestly. Like, <laughs> I, I do love that the dragons have this history to themselves, too, where yes. it's like these dragons are ancient enough to have multiple famous riders over the generations. And oh, the dragons are just so good. I yeah. wanted more dragon stuff. <laughs> You'll get it. Oh, well. Don't worry. You'll get it. I know. <laughs> um, so that's 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 going to be fun. But there is going to be basically, as far as I can tell, a Game of Thrones show a year coming out now. So um, oh, they started to spin now. up pr- production on. Look, if, if it if it maintains this quality, though, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have sure. a problem with it. I hope it does. Yeah. Um, 
but you know people are excited about this i have not read those novellas apparently they're like really fun um uh so it it should be interesting i don't know how many seasons they're gonna get one or two seasons out of this these novellas uh maybe a couple more um it has been said that house of the dragon is stopping uh after four seasons so hopefully we can still get that conclusion um yes at least there's a finite timeline for this so it's it's good when shows have a finite timeline yes uh it's bad when shows just start to go on forever because you run out of you you lose the plot hardcore yeah all right so uh we are going to we were gonna do borderlands next week but that seems bad and also we're not sure when it's coming out in korea so i'm not sure when i can watch it but one thing that is supposed to be good that we haven't seen is Deadpool and Wolverine. So we will do Deadpool and Deadpool and Wolverine next. Somehow week. neither of us have seen this yet. And yeah. and uh I will blame it on uh hey, it's tricky to get a babysitter sometimes. <laughs> uh you know, I'm not going to take my 13-month-old Deadpool and Wolverine. Um but uh cuz I don't want I don't want to uh put that on the other people in the theater. <laughs> but uh but yeah, I guess uh we'll we'll find uh, we'll find a time, yeah. So look forward to that next week. 